Hello everybody, Sanyer, Engineer, MBA and Investor. And in today's video, I want to talk about Bloomberg's interview with legendary Dr. Jennifer Doudna. This was released last night. I was watching it on the television and I thought to myself it would be an amazing idea to show it to you guys, to our viewers, to our subscribers. So before we do that, before we jump into today's video, you guys know the drill. Like this video, smash that like button destroy that like button really does help the channel youtube algorithms you guys know how they work if you've not subscribed yet please consider subscribing okay so let's go over this interview let's see if i can uh, give my comments here as we play through this interview between emily chang legendary uh, interviewer and journalist from bloomberg um, chang and with obviously legendary dr doudna which we've covered numbers of times in this channel so let's go ahead and play the clip. Talk to us about this new program and what the impact would be. Hi, Emily. We are so excited about this program. At the Innovative Genomics Institute, we launched the WISE program, Women in Entrepreneurial Science, founded by a wonderful female entrepreneurial philanthropist. We have an incredible opportunity to recruit the best female entrepreneurs to the Institute, give them a head start to get their ideas launched and then found companies off of those ideas. It's, a, it's an extraordinary opportunity. I'm delighted to be part of it. Why do we need more women in biotechnology in particular? I'm a big believer that the best science gets done by a diverse team. We have to have people from all walks of life contributing to the future of biotech. In genome engineering with CRISPR technology, we've seen over the last decade the extraordinary advances made both on the innovative side and also on the applied side. And I think that, you know, going forward, we just want to have the most, uh, you know, the largest opportunity to recruit people from everywhere to come into this field and work on opportunities in genome editing. What's your assessment of where we are at this phase of the pandemic, moving into hopefully post-pandemic and the role that CRISPR and gene editing will play in preventing the next pandemic from happening? CRISPR is such an extraordinary technology. I think, as you know, it came out of a, a study of a bacterial immune system. So it naturally works in nature as a, as a way of protecting cells against viral infection. And going forward, we're using it not only as a way to detect the presence of infectious agents, but also to use it to uh, you know, make the kinds of changes in the genome that could be protective against future infection. I think those are the two ways that we'll see CRISPR having an impact in the future to prevent the kind of pandemic that we've just been through. Now, there's been some... Actually, this is a great, uh, this is a segue into mammal biosciences, right? We've covered numbers of times in this channel. Obviously, mammal biosciences is backed by Dr. Doudna and her team. Uh, this is uh, this from University of Berkeley and so on. And Mammal Biosciences, like half of their team are literally working on diagnostics slash hardware when it comes to pandemic, when it comes to diseases, using CRISPR as a diagnostic tool, which we covered in this channel numerous of times. So let's keep, keep playing this clip here. Let's see if we can uh, uh, listen to more details from Doudna. Controversy in the CRISPR world recently, Berkeley recently lost a long and drawn out patent battle with MIT and Harvard's Broad Institute over the ownership of this technology. What's been your reaction to this? Well, Emily, you know, I think uh, this, this is a, a common theme in uh, areas of technology where there is extraordinary opportunity. There are always disputes about, you know, intellectual property and CRISPR is no different in that regard. I'm proud of the fact that UC Berkeley, University of California retains more than 45 uh, issued patents that are not part of the interference. So we have a very strong intellectual property suite around CRISPR. And we continue to do our, our work at the Innovative Genomics Institute and with our partner companies. We're not impeded in any way by that ongoing dispute. So on that note, how... Uh, so actually, this is a great statement from Doudna. Basically, this is a clear statement that they're going to go forward uh, at this point. I mean, they have no plan on, you know, partnering up with... Uh, the broad or MIT or Harvard, and it's quite, quite for quite straightforward. That statement from Dr. Downer. And by the way, I just want to remind you viewers, and I've said this in the past, 
all these interviews, okay, all these interviews, you know, the interviewee, in this case, Dr. Downa, they always get like an agenda of what type of questions will be asked by the interview, especially, especially on this type of platform. I mean, you'd be naive to think that, you know, these in interviews are done, like these questions, no one, they didn't expect those. Of course, they expected them. Uh, it's part of uh, agreeing to do an interview, right? Uh, especially these PR teams behind all these interviews from all these CEOs or leaders of companies or leadership or Nobel Prize winners like uh, Doudna there, uh, of course, they, they, they already know the questions, okay? Just keep that in mind, you know? A lot of people are like surprised, like, oh, wow, how was she able to answer like all straightforward and sort of talking about how they hold this many patents? I mean, <laughs> in real life, this is not how it works, right? This is not how it works. I mean, anybody that's working in corporations and giving interviews and answering questions of, uh, people asking them random questions know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, anyways, I'm going on a tangent there, so let's keep playing. How does this impact your efforts to, and your dream really, to commercialize this technology and apply it to hard problems for generations to come? Not at all. You know, I recently, I, was, uh, I had a wonderful conversation uh, just last week with Victoria Gray. She was the first United States uh, um, resident who received a CRISPR therapy for her sickle cell disease. Um, just incredible to talk with her and hear about the impact on her family, her life. She's now enrolling in business school, something she couldn't have imagined doing when she was dealing with the you know, ongoing impacts of sickle cell disease. And I think that's the future for CRISPR. We're going to see more and more opportunities to change people's lives in better way for, for the better. So talk to us about your near-term goals and your long-term goals on the therapeutic roadmap. Well, near term, I think we're, we're on a path to continue expanding the kinds of applications that CRISPR will be used for, not only for very rare disease, but I think in the future, using it as a way to protect against disease. And there already are companies, for example, Verve comes to mind that are on that same you know, path. And I think then, you know, further down the road, I think CRISPR eventually becomes a standard of care for certain types of disease. I think that's uh, something that, you know, I, I can envision. It, it will only happen if it's developed with an eye towards sustainability. It has to be affordable. You know, Victoria Gray's uh, treatment was uh, close to $2 million. So clearly we need to bring down the cost. And we think that one way to do that is to do the kind of research that we have ongoing at the Innovative Genomics Institute and then partner with companies when it makes sense. And what's your outlook on the future of biotech returns? I mean, for so many years, this was an underinvested in part of the tech landscape, certainly when you compare it to consumer and enterprise technology. Do you see a new era uh, for biotech investing being ushered in over the next decade? I do. And part of the reason, one thing I think is driving that actually is the intersection of biotech with other kinds of technologies, hard tech, for example, uh, computer science. You know, I think we, many of us see that there are amazing opportunities when these areas of technology converge. And that's what we're seeing right now. So I think the next decade in this area will be uh, very, very exciting for scientists and also for investors. So where are the next big bets? Where should investors be putting their money quickly? Well, one area I would I would recommend looking into is is agriculture and synthetic biology. These are these are areas where you know we need CRISPR and we need other technologies to address the challenges of climate change, of a growing uh, population on our planet. How do we keep people fed with the you know high nutritional value crops? CRISPR will play a big role there. That's a great interview. So basically, um, we have uh, Jason, uh, Jennifer Doudna talking about the status landscape of CRISPR patents. Uh, actually, in my opinion, I think she deflected the whole question. Uh, again, you, she already knew about the question, okay? You go on these interviews, you already know this question is going to come about. And you can already imagine how many times... He, she and her PR team or whoever she's involved with rehearsed this type of answer, right? Uh, I don't know if you guys caught that. She answered the question by saying it will not affect us at all. I'm quoting her on that. And basically then she started talking about Victoria Gray, um, which obviously is the first CRISPR-based uh, therapy patient ever and obviously has been successful since then. And then she started talking about cost, which is obviously $2 million, which is really a lot. You need to make it a lot more affordable. But the point here is that, to my opinion, I think she deflected the whole patents question. And I think it's a big question mark for a lot of investors. And, you know, these types of answers, I'm, I'm you know, I can't really blame her because she's not really... I mean, you know, I, I don't want her to be answering every single question about CRISPR and about patents. and It just doesn't make sense, right? She, she needs to specialize in what she's best at. 
And I don't necessarily think of, think that she's the best person to start talking about patents and licensing and commercial deals and partnerships and uh, infringement of patents. I think I don't think she's the right person. And it should be fine. I mean, this is why you have lawyers, right? This is why you have PR teams in different companies, in different institutions. It makes sense, right? You can't have one person do everything. But obviously, she has the mic right now, and she chose to come on this interview and answer it. And clearly, she deflected the question. Uh, but I think generally, she made some good points, you know, about technology leveraging um, CRISPR advancement. So obviously, she didn't mention this, but with big data, with artificial intelligence, you can reduce costs, reduce delays. We've, we've covered this in the channel. She's talking about two big bets, synthetic biology, which in my opinion is all about Ginkgo Bioworks right now in terms of a company you can invest in. And, um, and the second point was agriculture, which in my opinion, again, is Caribou Biosciences who hold patents over agriculture, their deal with Genus. Uh, that's the only public company, CRISPR company that holds some sort of uh, involvement with agriculture. And I totally agree with her. I think uh, agriculture is definitely a field that investors want to look further at, but it's a little bit hard to invest when there's really no companies really going big on it. I mean, you know, there's a bunch of private companies and a bunch of organizations that are looking into it and they're doing some work like we saw with mosquitoes in Florida, we saw with tomatoes, we saw with obviously the beef video that I made, the cattle beef uh, a few days ago. So clearly, and CRISPR space as well. So clearly there's a lot of involvement there. Uh, but unfortunately, when it comes to agriculture, we haven't really seen uh, many public CRISPR companies venture into it. But generally, I think it was a good interview. Like I said, I think that Jennifer Downa did good here. Uh, but again, as I mentioned before, these interviews, they already know the questions and that's how she was able to deflect this patent question. Uh, I mean, it's not hard to deflect a question when you already know it's gonna be coming, right? So just think about how many times she rehearsed it with her team and how she was able to shift towards the Victoria Gracie. Uh, story, which again, I totally agree with. I, I'm, I'm, I'm blown away from uh, Victoria's story, but essentially that has nothing to do with the patent situation, zero. Uh, but it was used to deflect the question, right? So it is what it is. Let me know in the comments below what you guys think about this interview, this quick five minutes, almost six minutes of video from Bloomberg. Shout out to Bloomberg, shout out to Emily Chang for covering this space and shout out to uh, Jennifer Damna for the amazing work that she's done in the space, especially the last 10 years. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you.